Hey everyone, it's Rob Ryder. It's uh, March 26th. Which one does that make it? What does that make? It makes today a Tuesday. March 26, 2013. My email address is courtofrecord at AOL.com. Rob Ryder with three B's on YouTube. And today we're going to talk about traffic tickets and where is the beef. And also uh, some interesting things about how they've altered the Constitution and forms of government. They don't really hide it. It's It's been written. And again, if you can uh, please help keep the lights on. It is the end of the month, and I don't have enough to pay my rent, nor my lights, nor my cable. And I count on you to help if you can, so please do. The PayPal account is Ashley Ritluski, A-S-H-L-E-Y-R-Y-T-L-E-W-S-K-I at gmail.com. Or my email, or my uh, uh, address Robert Ritluski, 10955, 14 Mile Road, Rockford, Michigan, 49341. All right, let's look at this. This is an Arizona traffic ticket and complaint. Apparently what they use in Arizona to give you a traffic ticket. And at the bottom it says it's an original complaint. All right, so... They're saying that this is a complaint. Arizona traffic ticket and complaint. Okay. Uh, and they can use this for, you know, criminal citations because uh, down here it's got criminal or civil. So let's go look at some Arizona criminal code. I'm going to want to blow this up first for you. Go away from it. this part right here. So what's the criminal code say? Well, what is a complaint? A complaint may be laid before a magistrate that a person has threatened to commit an offense against a person or property of another. <clears throat> okay, so it's a, a complaint may be laid before a magistrate. Where do you take a complaint? Before a magistrate. Who's a magistrate? They're all magistrates. The President of the United States is the chief magistrate. You got Judicial magistrates, uh, administrative magistrates, and uh, what would the other one be? Legislative magistrates. They're all magistrates. However, laid before a magistrate. Continuing on. When the complaint is laid before the magistrate, he shall examine on oath the complainant. So when you take a complaint to a magistrate, he shall examine on oath. In other words, he's going to render you an oath. And any witnesses he produces, and if there is just reason to believe the commission of offense is threatened by the person's complaint of an Im uh, is imminent, the magistrate shall issue a summons or warrant for arrest. Reciting the substance of the complaint, if a warrant of arrest is issued, it shall command the officer to forthwith arrest the person complained of and bring him before the magistrate. Well, that's what a complaint is. Pretty simple. You lay it before a magistrate, you swear to it. That's how you do it in the criminal code. However, Look at this. It says that uh, complaint <laughs> need not be verified. Complaints stating misdemeanor charges laid before a magistrate under the provisions of 133898 or filed with the magistrate under provisions of 13903 need not be sworn if they contain a form, a certification by the arresting officer in the substance as follows. I hereby certify that I have reasonable grounds to believe and do believe that the person cited herein committed the offense described herein contra contrary to law. That's the beef. Let's see if they we have any beef. Where are we? On this uh, original complaint, being a tr traffic ticket original co or complaint. I certify that upon reasonable grounds I believe the defendant committed the above violations and I have served a copy of the complaint upon the defendant. That's what that one says. And it does so it does not say I hereby certify that I have reasonable grounds to believe and do believe that the person cited herein committed the offense described herein contrary to law. And here they're saying you've done something contrary to law. In here, it doesn't say anything about law, but it says you committed a violation. It doesn't say you truly believe, or and do believe. 
So these aren't the same. So because to not be verified means it has to say this, right? This has to be on the complaint. I hereby certify that I have reasonable grounds to believe and do believe that the person cited herein committed the offenses described herein contrary to law. And because this one doesn't say that, then this Arizona traffic ticket and complaint being the original complaint, right, would have to be taken before the magistrate and sworn to on oath. They haven't done that. What they've done is a false certification under the provision of subsection A of this section shall constitute perjury. What they did is they committed perjury when they did this. That isn't what it says it needs to say um, if you're not going to put it under oath. So either they've committed perjury or they're simulating a legal process. You know, we're going to let the court decide. And on here they said you did a violation, right? Here it says violation. The above violations. Well, what is a violation? A violation is an act done unlawfully and with force. I, I thought you were driving down the road in your car. Right? And they gave you a criminal offense for speeding or whatever, right? Who knows what it is? <laughs> but, you know, there was no force involved. This this is like trespass or actually it's more like assault. They're charging you with assault. So here's that 1398. Arrest without warrant. Hang on just a second, please. Never freaking fails. Arrest without warrant. A person arrested with a warrant shall, without unnecessary delay, be taken before the nearest and most accessible magistrate in the county for which the arrest occurred, and a claim shall be made before the magistrate. So again, right, they would make the complaint before the magistrate. That's what they should do. Um, the provisions of subsection A of this section shall not apply where the person is arrested, uh, uh, making the arrest as a peace officer, and decides to proceed under provisions 13903. And 13903 says notice to appear and complaint. In any case, which a person is arrested for a misdemeanor offense, or a petty offense, the arresting officer may release the arrested person from custody in lieu of taking the person to a law enforcement facility by use of the procedures described in the section. Right, So they don't need to take you to the facility, they could let you go. <clears throat> At any time after taking a person arrested for a misdemeanor offense or petty offense to a law enforcement facility, the officer may, the officer instead of taking the person to the magistrate, may release the person from further custody by use of the procedures described in this section. So whether they take you to the facility or not, they don't necessarily have to take you before a magistrate if they follow this procedure. If a person is arrested for a misdemeanor offense or a petty offense and the offense is listed in some subsection C, uh, you got to get fingerprints. In any case in which the person is arrested for a misdemeanor offense or a petty offense, the arresting officer may prepare in quadruplicate a written notice to appear and complaint. And as we can see here, this says it's a complaint. It doesn't say it's a notice. So we need a written notice containing the name, address, person, the offense charge, time and place where the person shall appear in court provided. You need a written notice and a complaint. The time specified, the place specified, the arresting the arrested person in order to secure release, as provided in this section, shall give his written promise to so appear in the court by signing at least one copy of the written notice and the complaint. The notice and the complaint. And again, this is a notice or this is a complaint. It doesn't meet the qualification of uh, uh, not need being need to, not needing to be put under oath, but it's still one. And it says here you must appear. It's going to give the date, and you're going to sign it, All right? So that's your promise to appear.
Okay. And then uh, the officer shall deliver a copy of the notice and complaint to the person promising to appear. Thereupon, the officer shall forthwith release the person arrested from custody. So before you leave, you should have a copy, a written notice, and a written complaint of what you've signed both and you've delivered to you before you leave. The officer, as soon as practical, shall deliver the original notice and the complaint to the magistrate specified therein. Thereupon, the magistrate shall promptly file the notice and complaint and enter it into the docket of the court. So when you go to the court, you should see a notice and a complaint. Just like if you go look in the court docket, you should see a motion and a notice of motion or a notice of filing for the motion. But then there will be separate entries for the notice and the motion. There will be separate entries for the notice and the complaint. The Arizona traffic ticket and complaint may be utilized not only for the purposes provided by Arizona Supreme Court rule, but to satisfy the requirements of this section. Well, of what section? Well, of it being the, no, um, the original complaint. Nowhere on here does it say it's any kind of notice. and it doesn't have the proper certi certificate on it. That's perjury. Uh, when a person is given his written promise to appear, so what you're really giving them is your promise to appear. Now this is where they're going to get you. And thereafter fails to appear, personally or by counsel, or on or before the date, the court clerk or other court staff shall file a complaint in writing under oath. It's funny, they need to file a complaint in writing under oath setting forth the offense knowingly violating a written promise to appear in court in accordance with section this section. They're going to file a complaint for failure to appear, having nothing to do with the fact that, you know, it's not a valid complaint. You promise to appear. You put your signature on to promise to appear. And they're going to say, well, you promised to appear on this date. You're not here. We're going to file a complaint. Uh, okay, so, and the magistrate shall issue a warrant for arrest upon such person's appearance in court, arraignment of the charge violating this section. The court will also arraign the person on the charge stated in the notice to appear and complaint for which the person was previously promised to appear. But they never put in this stuff on the records, right? They're just going to say, do you understand the charges? You know, you don't even know that you're there for failure to appear. Or that's the real charge. This section does not affect peace officer authority to conduct an otherwise lawful search incident uh, through the arrested person as related to taking the police station before magistrate pursuant to this section. Any person knowingly violating his written promise to appear given as provided in this article is guilty of a class two misdemeanor regardless of the disposition of the charge upon which he was originally arrested. In other words, you're guilty of a class two misdemeanor for not appearing regardless of whether you've contested the uh, the validity of the, the validity of the original complaint. So, a written promise to appear in court may be complied with by an appearance by counsel. Okay. So, what are they guilty of, right? If they're not, uh, right? If 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 this doesn't have the proper certification on it, and there's not a notice, written notice that you've been given then they're guilty of simulating the legal process. So your complaint, your com criminal complaint would be that um, the uh, traffic ticket does not meet the criteria of section 13-3899 because it doesn't say I hereby certify that I've reasonable grounds to believe and do believe that the person cited herein committed an offense described herein contrary to law. And further it says that you create that you perform some unlawful act with force, right? That you're guilty of um, assault. And they're going to simulate a legal process to do this. So a person commits simulating a legal process if such person knowingly sends or delivers to another 
any document falsely purporting to be an order or other document that simulates civil or criminal process. And they're also guilty of perjury. It's a class 4 felony. Person commits uh, perjury of making either a false sworn statement in regards to material issue, believing it to be false, a false unsworn declaration, certificate, verification, or statement in regard to a material issue that the person subscribes as true under penalty of perjury, believing it to be false. In other words, right, that you cre that you are guilty of a violation, an act done unlawfully with force. I certify that upon reasonable grounds I believe the defendant committed the above violation, some unlawful act by force. And I have served a copy of the complaint upon the defendant. That isn't what it said to write. So I think you can challenge it. And what else was there on this particular one? Oh, class four felony can have can have up to two and a half years of incarceration. I bet you the cop acts a lot different when he hears that than he did when he stopped you. He'd be crying for his mama. And uh, so if they want to change these forms in any way, right, Substan uh, substantial variation to the Arizona traffic ticket complaint form, right, they have to get uh, certification. So basically, I asked Bobby in Arizona if you know this pretty much looked like what they looked like and he said yeah that looks a lot like the one they gave him all right Arizona traffic ticket and complaint there it is so where's the beef right you need to file a criminal complaint well, what you need to do is you need to go look in your criminal code right because that's where this came out of and you, and you start looking around the word complaint to see what it takes to do a complaint, right? It's it's pretty simple. When a complaint is laid before a magistrate, he shall examine on oath the complainant. That's the way it's done in criminal law. Under oath, a cop don't need to put it under oath if it says this: I hereby certify, reasonable grounds to believe and do believe the person cited herein committed the offense described, wherein herein contrary to law. It doesn't say that he's just committed perjury. They're charging you with a violation, which is an act done unlawfully with force. And they're doing that on a document that is simulating a legal process. And they're also guilty of perjury. You just point these things out. You cite the, the number and the name, the number, a brief couple sentences why you believe it is and you submit it to the complaint and then if they believe there's probable cause they have to go and investigate they got two choices issue an arrest warrant or issue a subpoena <clears throat> so you know I'm sure that in every state if you just go look a little bit closer with eyes wide open clear mind not in fear you're going to find very simply where they've made a mistake. And it's always going to be at the very beginning. Something to do with the complaint, something to do with the notice, something to do with the summons. In Michigan, if they if they file a criminal complaint, then the summons that will be generated, well actually any summons generated in Michigan, it will say on it, in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. If that isn't what they say. It may say the state of Michigan but it won't say in the name of the people of the state of Michigan and if that isn't what they've used then they didn't give you a proper summons. They violated a court rule, you point it out, they won't correct it. It's a, uh, um, well that's one more I should looked up here. If they won't correct it and you get a default judgment then you put in a criminal complaint because they um, slandered your good name. Somebody brought a complaint against you, it's been in the newspaper, it's been whatever public record made, it's slander. So you could add slander to this list. In fact, I would add slander because one of the things you're going to ask for is you want them to restore your good name. So enough on traffic tickets. Look at this real quick. 
This is the State Constitution of Michigan, Board of Supervisors. A Board of Supervisors shall be established in each organized county consisting of one member of each organized township. This is how the Constitution, this is how our government is supposed to be set up by the Constitution. But when you read closely, <laughs> constitutionality, section held invalid under federal Constitution. Are they saying that by the federal Constitution, this section of the Michigan Constitution is invalid? Apparently so. What's invalid about having one member of each organized township? Right? That's what we all think it is. We think we have townships and we think we have township supervisors. Supreme Court, federal level, has said that's unconstitutional. And this was in the advisory opinion, constitutionality of some public act. Uh, statute declared constitutional and provisions of the state constitution declared invalid. The statute, this public law, was declared constitutional and provisions of the state constitution, this, was declared invalid. And here's the story. Responding to a request of the governor submitting to this court pursuant to provisions of uh, The Constitution, Article 3 and 8, 5 Justices advise that Public Act 1966-261 violated the um, Michigan Constitution. So that was the first thing, right? Now they're reconsidering this. What's, what's it from? Well, first of all, what's this act? An act that provides for the appropriate of county boards of commissioners to prescribe the size of the boards, provide for appeals, to prescribe manner of election of members of the county board of commissioners. See, this county board of commissioners um, isn't in the um, Constitution. But we're going to have a county board of commissioners. And what's an appropriate uh, approach? Effort, yeah, whatever that is. Well, it's the distribution of benefits, uh, general average of contribution or ties, a rent charge, right? So they're going to distribute that differently. Won't be through the township. The specific, the specific words employed were that the constitutional provisions, Article 7, Subsection 7, is valid and therefore the public act is not. All right, that was what they first determined, and now they're going to review it. And what 7 says is that there would be a Board of Supervisors. A Board of Supervisors shall be established in each organized county consisting of one member of each organized township. <clears throat> when that opinion was delivered to the governor, it was thought that a group of cases known as something or other, something or other, then due for submission before the Supreme Court might be dispositive of the question posed to the governor. But, but it turned out not to be so. Um, review now controlling a Avery case was granted. 388 U.S. 905, Serratoria, which is the Supreme Court has now decided Avery versus Midland County, Texas, Five of the eight participating justices summarized as follows. That now requires recall and reversal of the aforesaid advisory opinion. And the first advisory opinion was um, that this public act with the commissioners violated the Constitution. But because of what the Supreme Court is doing here in this Avery versus Midland, they got to change that now and say that the act is okay. It's the Michigan Constitution that has a problem. Our decision today is only that the constitutional Constitution opposes one ground rule for the development and arrangement of local government, a requirement that the units in, with general governmental powers over the entire geographical area not be appropriate appropriate to. <laughs> apportioned along single member districts of substantially unequal population. Okay, 
They can't have single member districts where there's one voting member for the district where the districts have unequal population. That's the problem. Avery, as of April 1st, 18, or 1968, has become supreme law and made so by the sixth article. It binds the court and all state courts to promptly responsive obedience, applying it to section 7 and 18 of article 7 of our constitution we may conclude only that Avery has rendered section 7 unconstitutional particularly on account of section 18's requirement that each township supervisor shall be elected one supervisor for each township regardless of those disparities of town populations of townships they just said that uh, rendered section 7 unconstitutional in our constitution I don't think anybody ever told us that. It's still written in the Constitution that it's Section 7's in there. The Avery case considered, it is our opinion that Public Act 1966-261 is valid. Section 7 of 7, article not, uh, of Article 7 notwithstanding from the Constitution. For Avery has just lifted Section 7 out of our Constitution, leaving the rest of Article 7 intact with the legislature left free to implement it in the manner as if no section 7 ever appeared therein. Just act like it isn't there even though it's written in the Constitution. It's PFM man, pure fucking magic. Okay so it goes on a little bit but then there's a guy descending so Without the benefits of arguments for our court today, hasty declares unconstitutional the inter, in, inter, integrated scheme of local government adopted by the people of Michigan in 1963. No statute, much less constitutional provision, ought to be presumed unconstitutional unless Michigan's constitution mandates a system of county government on a basis other than one man, one vote. It should be held valid. Michigan's 1963 constitution does not require dis proportion representation of the county boards of supervisors. See, it shouldn't matter how many people are in a district because every man has a vote, but that isn't how it works, is it? You vote for a representative to represent you. That's how they have it working now. If it was one man, one vote, it wouldn't matter how many people were in each township if you're voting for the governor or something like that. Article 7, subsection 7, all board supervisors shall be established in each organized county consisting of one member of each township, such representation from cities as provided by law. Article 7, 17 provides each organized township shall be a body corporate with powers and immunities provided by law. So those are the powers a township is supposed to have. And <laughs> We found out they ain't got any power, man. They're not even going to take in the proper oath. And here's where all this shit came down. Michigan's integrated system of local self-government is not in conflict with a one-man, one-vote principle. Our Constitution says nothing about the size or shape or boundaries of the townships. Restructuring of townships is entirely within the province of the, the, legis of the legislature. So what he's saying is if they wanted to do it by population, they could have just changed the, the way the townships are structured. Our Constitution requires that the members of the County Board of Supervisors represent their constituents, not only as residents of the county, but also in their capacity as an organized corporate local body politic. In other words, your domicile. That's what they're supposed to represent you as in your domicile. The citizens of Michigan already find themselves encircled by a maze of conflicting and overlapping boundaries. Township lines, school board lines, state representative district lines, state senatorial district lines, and congressional district lines have all been drawn independently and without necessary relation to one another. They're just scattered all off top. It's all over the map. Cross boundary lines and everything else. The public act, the legislature would impose still another independent, irrelevant set of boundaries upon our citizens, contrary to the clear mandate of the 1963 Constitution of Michigan. It is my opinion that the application of Avery's one man one vote principle in Michigan will require the change of township boundaries. That any new supervisor districts which are drawn will by operation of Article 7, subsection 7 and 17, 
become townships, having all the powers and incident associated with local township government. So it's not in the township hall. It's this board of supervisors, or the county commissioners, as they call them here. No one claims in this court or elsewhere that the legislature does not have the power to change township boundaries. No one claims the legislature could not change township boundaries so that the township of any given county would be approximately equal in population. And if our townships were thus restructured, all would agree that Article 7.7 would not offend against one man, one vote principle. But without the benefit of argument or brief, without hearing the pros and cons of township restructuring, our court chooses to assume that such thing would be unworkable and undesirable. I submit that it is workable. I submit that it is desirable. That was the, devent, the dissenting voice. I submit that it is a integrated scheme of local government which our people adopt in the Constitution we are sworn to uphold. And your township has no power. And this is what happened in Avery versus Midland. A Supreme Court case that ruled that local government districts had to be roughly equal in population. Right? So if your townships don't have about the same amount of population, they're saying you can't use them. They had to come up with a different local government district. No different than the District of Columbia. Having already held in 1965, the disparities in legislature, districts violated, yada, 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 the, district, the Supreme Court applied the same logic to local government districts for bodies which also have broad policy-making functions. In other words, the, the powers of the township. And if your township is functioning, you're supposed to go down there, become a registered elector, and then you can appoint the board to be your agents and your attorney. And they got rid of it. They, they said that part is unconstitutional. The case was brought by Henry Avery, more commonly known as Hank Avery, who was the mayor of the city of Midland, Texas. He challenged the districting scheme of the Commissioner's Court of Midland County, a five-member county commission with four commissioners elected in single-member districts and a county judge elected at large. So basically they split the county into four pieces. Each one has a single member that represents it, and then the judge was elected at large. One commissioner's district, which included almost all of the city of Midland, had a population of about 68,000. The others, all rural, had populations of 852, 414, 828. So obviously, right, you got 1,200, eh, 1,600 people who had three votes to them, and 68,000 that have one vote. It really isn't proportioned. And so, um, since it wasn't proportioned, they changed the, uh, they just changed the lines. And so, what it meant here in Michigan is, instead of having township supervisors, we now have, what did they call them? We now have County Board of Commissioners. And each um, district that a commissioner has has about the same amount of population. So when you look at these County Board of Commissioners, a map of them, you'll see that, like where I'm at, my commissioner's got two and a half townships. But there's commissioners closer to Grand Rapids that have, you know, maybe half a township. It's all done by size but it became the local government with all the powers of the um, township board. So yeah, Tom, the township's got no power. When you go and talk to them again, let them know that. Uh, Tom up in Alpena went to a township board meeting last night because uh, his boss has two trailers on basically an empty lot and uh, I guess the township doesn't want them there and they gave him a notice. So again, he got a notice, right? He didn't get a complaint, just got a notice. And so they went to the township hall meeting last night and Tom was asking the, the guy that had served it, one of the trustees, you know, what's the process? And the guy said, well, I put a notice on and 30 days or so, if he hasn't done anything, I put another notice on and, 
in another 30 days, I give them a final notice. And Tom said, that's fine. You're, you're explaining the notice process to me. Where's the claim? Well, the guy didn't know what he was you know, talking about. He's just doing the way it always is. Well, I, I, I'm giving him the notices. Well, no, you're, 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 you're making a false accusation. You're committing fraud. And, of course, that took everybody aback, and they had everybody in the township hall, which was, was un unusually full. And Tom said, you know, don't bring any more notices to the property. Right? You, you have not filed it. You have not filed a claim. You haven't filed a charge. You haven't filed a complaint. All they're given is a notice. And then after three notices, they're going to put in something for refusing to answer a notice or something like that and start their shenanigans. But there was never a claim filed. So this probably happened in every state, right? You probably, everybody has something where what you thought was a local government has been replaced um, because of redistricting by size. And that was uh, Avery versus Midland County, Texas, 1968, 390 U.S. 474. So, anyways, I just wanted to, things I'm trying to get off my desk. Two things I've been wanting to point out. How to look at a traffic ticket differently. Don't believe everything you see with township halls and what people tell you. None of that stuff exists. Right? And that's why we're looking in different drawers than we had been before. And uh, because it all comes down to claiming your domicile in the municipality that's a self-functioning government within a state um, as a U.S. national or a citizen of the United States of America domiciled in Rockford, Michigan, right, within the state. You don't want the state to be a residence. You want to be domiciled within the state. And more on that soon. we got some really crazy stuff that's happened the last couple days that uh, try to put a video together, uh, video together on. Okay, have a great night. See you all.